So hello and welcome to this uh, second day session. Uh, here we are actually going to move away from what we've heard perhaps for the last day and then this morning where we spoke really about political freedoms, about freedom of expression, uh, about where the internet was headed uh, on those and speak very specifically about the world of business because of course most of us are deluded into thinking the internet is meant for us. Um, but in fact what keeps it going is uh, the trade that, uh, that the internet brings uh, with it. And certainly internet trade has changed the way the world looks at, um, uh, at, uh, at doing business. It's changed the way in, in, in many respects. So what we're hoping to do in the next one hour and 15 minutes, because of course the, the cardinal rule of all discussions is never get in the way of an audience and it's lunch. <laughs> uh, but apart from that, uh, what we're discussing today is called No Trade-Off. I'll explain that to you in just a bit. Re reconciling privacy and security uh, for global trade. And that, that is the big thing. Now, you're seeing uh, a Twitter feed up there. It's not just going up there on its own. We have uh, to my left over here, uh, Gok Gokhan and Nigat, uh, who are the digital curators. So if anyone is tweeting... Uh, there is, of course, the tweet, uh, the hashtag, which is SIF14. There is also the hashtag SIF14C, 14C being for uh, this particular room. Uh, I also want to start with the disclaimer to say that I myself am not an expert on internet trade, but everybody here is. Um, but I do want to make sure that we, we are going to uh, bring this discussion alive by engaging all of you in it. So if I could just start with a show of hands and ask how many of you in this room actually come from uh, the business side, deal with internet trade, either research on it or actually work on it. There is a lot. How many of you are actually coming to it from perhaps the civil society, worry about privacy side? That just gives me, I mean, I'm not identifying you. I'm just get, getting an idea of... Uh, who we are working with uh, today. Today we're also looking at the logistical aspect of uh, the, the kind of restrictions we see in data flows of all kinds. Why do we need those data flows? Why are they getting restricted? What are the kinds of restrictions? And most importantly, what are the solutions going forward? Very broadly, there are, of course, the cross-border data flow restrictions that We've all heard about, and, and it seems pretty logical that while the internet seems seamless in the sky or in ether, uh, on the ground, the moment you go from one country to another, you are going to have some flow, uh, data flow restrictions. There are restrictions within countries uh, for business reasons, when countries decide uh, or inadvertently stop businesses from growing simply because of the kind of regulations they have uh, to data flows, and many of our uh, participants are going to tell you about those. There are the political restrictions, which creep into absolutely everything, since uh, we have been given that rule yesterday that the problem is not technological, it really is political, and so are the solutions. And increasingly, in the past year, uh, it has been about... The, the contest between privacy and security. In the name of security is the kind of privacy that we are seeing depleting on a daily basis. And this comes uh, to the business sphere as much as it does. On the other hand, is our concern for privacy actually restricting the data flows when it comes to conducting reasonable trade? Uh, what kind of impact are they, are they having? We're going to come to this debate from every and uh, I can assure you, let me, just, um, uh, let, me, let me just start by introducing all our panelists. Right there at the extreme end is Jean-Jacques Sahel. He's the vice president of ICANN Europe. We heard from him yesterday uh, as well. Um, right next to him is Lucy Perdon, the program support manager for uh, ICT at the Institute for Human Rights and Business. And... Uh, uh, while, all our, um, uh, while all our panelists deserve a round of applause, Lucy deserves that extra one for giving the name uh, No Trade-Off, because it was the report brought out by IHRB, which is available. I, I, I hope you all have a copy of it. It has many very uh, pertinent examples from the past year, particularly of those kinds of restrictions, or the past few years at least, of the kinds of restrictions and what they mean. Uh, next to her is Beryl Adi, a program advisor for the Kenya Human Rights Commission, 
Uh, she also tweets as the Spanner Girl, the Spanner Gal. Uh, we'll ask you about that later. Um, <laughs> but uh, Beryl has very, very uh, on the ground uh, look at, at how a lot of these issues are playing out in Kenya and sub Saharan Africa as well. Um, we're pleased to have with us Hannah Melin. She's the Policy Strategy Council for eBay Incorporated. She's going to speak about a lot of things, and she has very kindly <laughs> agreed to also speak about everyone's recent concerns about eBay, uh, which does, in a sense, lend itself into the larger debate when we start looking for solutions. Um, uh, did I say that I... Well, yeah. you now have. <laughs> It's been said. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, certainly, is Manius Rensog. If all of you have seen uh, the No Transfer, No Trade paper that's also available over here, I do suggest you take a copy with you because, again, it in includes many, um, many important uh, 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 studies pertinent to Sweden, but also that would work uh, for, for countries around the world. And Manius, it is to you that I want to turn first. And begin by asking, when we talk about data flows, most would say, uh, are data flows really critical to every business? Uh, why, why has it suddenly become an issue? Why wasn't it an issue before? Thank you very much. Um, yes, it's critical for every business. And I think that's an important point to stress when you talk about the internet from a, a business perspective. We tend to talk about Google, twi Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, eBay, for example, but internet, using internet as a tool uh, for your business is for everyone from big to small, from high tech company to low tech company. And in this report that you referred to that, that we did, we interviewed a lot of uh, companies asking them why do you need data flows, considering the debate around data flows. <coughs> and well, to sum it up, they said, well, we cannot trade if we can't send data. Uh, more specifically, we, they we grouped the needs into two groups. One is about the business offer, uh, that you cannot trade without data. As I said, uh, data has to move somewhere in the business offer. It may be in the communication, the payment, the delivery of the good, or av after that in the continuous relationship between uh, a company and the customer. You have this kind of monitoring, uh, monitoring um, systems that you can, for example, monitor trucks while they're out running, for example, and you have upgrades of software and so forth. So you have a, all through the business relationship you have with your customer, you need to move data. <coughs> and also a lot of companies use, for example, cloud solution as part of the business offer. You're uh, helping your customers with bookkeeping, you keep the book, uh, the numbers up in the cloud somewhere usually in Ireland, for our Swedish companies. Uh, so in a sense, without being able to move data, they not, cannot offer these, uh, neither these goods or these services. And as I said, this goes for all companies at all levels. The second reason why they need to move it has to do with internal efficiency, the way you run your company. Uh, most companies perhaps have a subsidiary abroad. You need to move uh, human relation data, salary data, you know, information about your employees, you have a foreign R&D affiliate, you have a foreign R&D uh, company that you work with, you have to send them data so you can develop new products, new solutions, and so forth. You use cloud solutions as part, as I said, about increasing efficiency, efficiency in your company. Um, you know, again, bookkeeping, for example, or your travel arrangements or whatever. So you, you need that for, for you, your um, uh, internal efficiency. And also, I mean, we tend to look at this discussion from a consumer perspective a lot of time, uh, the final step. But looking back, you know, that product, production today takes place in global value chains, which is spread out. And keeping that running, making it effective, you need to move data to control that flow, to be able to produce the goods and services that we all want today. So in that sense, uh, data is immensely important as I said, for all companies, big and small, high tech, low tech. Um, to sum it up, no data, no trade. No trade at all. In yeah. fact, increasingly, uh, that's going to that's going to be uh, the trend. Uh, Lucy, you've you've worked on this as a look at what happens when data flow gets restricted, and particularly in the wake of the Snowden 
revelations. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, did, how did the last year really pan out? Thank you, and, and thank you for that amazing introduction as well. That really made my day. So, um, yeah, following on from the report that Magnus um, mentioned, we were asked by the Swedish Ministry of Trade to produce a piece of work on how the Snowden revelations could impact the free flow of information as governments start to enact policies to try and keep data safe from um, foreign intelligence agencies by restricting data flows, which in turn could affect trade. So we put together this discussion paper. Um, there are copies over there, and I'm happy to email it to anyone who's interested outlining you know, some of these issues. And as Magnus said, um, free movement of data is a critical part of trade. Businesses of all sizes rely on the internet to reach markets and conduct global transactions through having websites, cloud computing, social media, mobile payments, etc. But the free flow of information is also entwined with the enjoyment of human rights. So if governments restrict how information flows, it can affect a range of human rights, including freedom of expression, association, the right to seek, receive and impart information, the right to work, education, the list goes on. Um, also, if consumers fear that their data is being compromised or surveilled, this can chill data flows and also reduce economic activity. So this project is a, a really neat way to intertwine human rights with other goals that governments want to achieve. So the piece of work we're doing is in two parts. This discussion paper identifies 10 situations where government policy could restrict the flow of information. And some of these problems were valid pre-Snowden, but the Snowden revelations compounded the problem and have, have heightened the tension. And then we also finish off with a set of policy recommendations at the end of the paper. Now, all of this will feed into a larger study on how these um, situations are actually affecting smaller businesses and economies in developing countries um, like Kenya, like Myanmar, and possibly Brazil as well, we're going to look at. So the questions are, you know, what is putting the chills on the free flow of information? You know, what policies or technical measures could get in the way of the free flow of information? And it was mentioned yesterday that there are no technical solutions, which I, I don't agree with. I think there is a potential for a mixture of policy and technical solutions as we move forward. And on that, and on a personal note, um, I would like to say that it is a shame that Jay put Jacob Applebaum and others are not here, as I was looking forward to hearing their thoughts on this. You know, as Gillian mentioned this morning, their technical knowledge and insights are very valuable, and they are very valued members of this community. So I look forward to the day when all of us can sit in the same room together to discuss solutions, all free and all equal. Anyway, so back to business. So the 10 restrictions on the free flow of information that we've identified are forced data localization, localization of email services, building undersea cables, and if there's any techies in the audience, I'd really like to talk about this further, censorship of content through filtering or blocking, blocking or disconnecting networks, which has been a problem for some time, um, blocking certain technologies such as Twitter or Skype. We've seen this um, recently, especially in, in Turkey. Requirements that internet users register with the government, um, requirement to install screening or surveillance mechanisms in imported hardware, restricting cross-border data flows as part of data protection, and in requiring intermediaries to make a judgment about content to be removed. And I really agree with Dunya yesterday when she spoke about the right to be forgotten and that a lot of the issues that this raises are not necessarily to do with protecting privacy, but about pre um, preventing, uh, but affecting the flow of information. And as we've said, whatever affects the flow of information disrupts trade and therefore affects economies too. So we don't have time to go through all 10 <laughs> today, but there was a couple that I did want to pick up on just because they've been mentioned in the past few days. And the first one was data localization. So this has been around for a while. You may remember a few years ago that um, Yahoo decided to locate the servers for their Vietnamese um, blogging platform in Singapore, in Singapore rather than Vietnam because they were worried about um, the government trying to access that data and um, identifying bloggers and, and arresting them. But post Snowden, a few countries have proposed that all data pertaining to their citizens must be based within their borders. This is ostensibly to protect citizens from NSA interception, but we, we know the risks. Um, for example, Russia has done this, but they've also put in place a law that um, popular bloggers must register with the government, so we can see how this is probably going to affect them, the flow of information. Brazil also floated this idea about data localization in an early draft of the Marco Seville, but they dropped it from the final version because of um, an outcry about how it was going to affect the flow of information trade. A lot of companies got involved to say how much it was going to affect their business. So I have a little more to say about that when we come to solutions. 
but um, I'd be really interested to hear from others and especially the businesses in the room about what the impact of data localization actually is and what extra costs would it add to a business and you know would it put a business off offering a service altogether in a country that mandated that, um, that you know forced data localization so um, the second um, issue I wanted to talk about was undersea cables so one of the allegations in the Snowden files was that governments, including my own in the UK, are tapping the fibre optic cables that carry internet traffic. And some countries are now reportedly building undersea cables to bypass these countries um, so they are less likely to be intercepted. And again, I'd really like to hear from the technical community on this. You know, what does this mean? Is this really a, a problem? And what will be the impact of this on the internet? You know, will data localization and undersea cables lead to a fragmentation of the internet? Or is this an exaggeration? And actually, you know, um, undersea cables is a good thing. It's going to increase connectivity, etc. So I'll leave it there, but I can raise a few more right. later on if, um, if we have time. Many places where privacy is under threat and... Hannah, then I do have to come to you as someone who represents the industry that benefits from all this trade. Clearly a lot of privacy concerns. There are so many ways uh, in which just regular global trade online impinges on security, uh, imp uh, impinges on people's privacy. Excuse me. Um, the, the question would really be, is it worth it then? Is it worth it? You've, you've spoken about how uh, internet trade is able to build micro multinationals and that's certainly um, uh, credible uh, but the question that's come up much more in the last year post the Snowden surveillance uh, is really should we be allowing these uh, these uh, 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 business to somehow subvert if you like the process of privacy for people well your first question was whether it's worth it mm -hmm. uh, so let me give you a perspective on um, whether it is worth it. And it's coming back to what Magnus was saying, that um, data flows are benefiting you know, the smallest and the, the non-tech firm. Um, eBay is made up of, of several companies. Uh, so you have PayPal, a uh, payment service provider, you have eBay, the marketplace, and you have eBay Enterprises providing uh, multi-channel services and mar uh, digital marketing. But if we look at the eBay marketplace, um, which has over the last years sort of morphed into a platform, um, a platform used by largely small businesses uh, to set up their they're one part of their operations. Um, and what we have seen through a research program that we've been running for two years is that those companies that make use of, and in this case eBay marketplace, but it can be any online marketplace and it can be any combination of, of the internet and digital services. When they, when they sort of use that power, uh, they, they go ahead and build international businesses. So what we, what we did two years ago almost uh, was um, hook up with a team of external economists from Geneva University, Oxford University and Sidley Austin in Geneva. And uh, we made the big mistake perhaps of giving economists access to, uh, to data, to a large database. Uh, of um, transactions, sort of trade flows and export behavior. And they have been going on since then. <laughs> and what they've done is that they've studied um, how international trade that comes off the eBay marketplace looks compared to, or taking as a reference point, traditional trade. So what they found is, or what, yeah, what I think this research shows and which I will tell you about is how trade at the intersection of technology looks, or could look. And how does it look? Well, I can tell you that more than 90% of small businesses, and, and those are retailers and entrepreneurs, that use the eBay marketplace all over the world, they export, they sell internationally. And we just released, so we have been releasing studies about this uh, throughout these two years, and we just recently, a, a few weeks ago, uh, released uh, a report on India, in effect. And there we see that 98% of small businesses on eBay India, they export. And if we compare that to traditional firms, the, the picture is very different. 
Um, in general, so using World Bank enterprise survey data, you find that 14% of firms have international businesses. And if you look at the sort of the largest, those with more than 100 employees, even there, uh, the number is of course lower than 98. It's 54% export. So these sort of small technology-enabled businesses, they are international. And it's not, we're not talking one or two countries. We're talking 30 to 40, on average, different countries that these businesses reach. They sell, some of them sell to, directly to customers in more than 100 countries. And, and this is, this is at the heart of some of them, their survival. Um, for them to be able to survive in these sort of financial times. And, and what do we see, what's the reason for this very different picture that we see when digital comes in compared to traditional? It has to do with trade costs. It has to do with something as simple as overcoming the physical distance. Traditionally, if you increase distance by 10%, you'll see a drop in trade by 15 to 20 percent. We looked at 220 countries. When we studied traditional trade data, we found a drop by 18 percent. When we looked at eBay data, the same 220 countries, the drop was only 3 percent. Because trade costs are lower, because information and communication frictions are so much lower, and it really matters. As I was saying, 98% exporting, reaching 30 to 40 markets. Uh, the way we have come to explain this is through an internationalization model uh, that we see developing. An internationalization model sort of parallel to the global value chain model, more commonly talked about. The model we see, and we call it the global empowerment network, it's basically made up of building blocks that can be adapted to the needs of small businesses and that empower, enable them to trade directly with foreign countries. The building blocks we have identified, and the two first are very relevant for this panel, are an open, global connected internet. The second one is the digital services that run on top of the internet. And remember, those services are made up of data and communication flows. The second building block are smart logistics. And the third one is the right policy to sort of underpin this framework. And so leaving you with, with well, this global empowerment network as we see the explanation or a reason for this new technology-enabled trade. But also one more point. What we found using regression models is that international, the existing international trade agreements or free trade agreements, they have no or very little impact on this type of trade I've been talking about. Technology enabled, small business exporting. And one may wonder why. Is it because the existing, but perhaps not the ones coming into effect, but the existing free trade agreements are not sufficiently supporting or helping to maximize the efficiency and the affordability and accessibility of digital services. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my contribution <laughs> all right. to your question Fair of enough. whether it's worth it. You've, you've, you've certainly set out the, uh, the case for why internet trade is now, I think, the fastest growing trend, uh, perhaps, uh, in global trade. I do also have to ask you, are our eBay accounts safe? Yes, <laughs> yes, they are very safe. They are safe. We, of course, data protection is top priority. It's always been top priority, and we invest huge resources in it. And as a precautionary uh, measure, when we understood, discovered and then understood that uh, a part of uh, a database, a part of a database had been compromised, we asked all users, all users we asked to change their passwords. Uh, that said, uh, of course, passwords are encrypted and we have no evidence that they have been uh, actually uh, compromised. Because compromised. You, you understand that it feeds into the general fear of the consumer. As Vanya said, maybe a lot of research is consumer-ended, um, but there is that question that 
big businesses tend to take all our information. As someone said, you either pay with money or you pay with your identity. Mm -hmm. You pay, uh, uh, and and then we suddenly hear about these vast data leakages. We hear about data being sold. Uh, and all the rest, and that just sets up civil society in a sense against businesses. Um, uh, Jean-Jacques, if I could then ask you, simply because there is this kind of uh, trade-off between uh, privacy and security, which we we all kind of uh, we all make, um, but there is equally this 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 sense that businesses are, while they see themselves as the victim of the kind of data flows uh, restrictions. They are also, in fact, a part of the big problem. So maybe let's, let's just think about it. I think you said earlier, you know, the problem, you talked about the, the problems between the global trade and privacy. Or the, the, I think we should be very clear. Global trade in itself is not a threat to privacy or security. It's some of the practices by individual companies uh, that may be a problem for privacy and security or by some... Uh, government agencies in some cases, of course. So global trade in itself is not a problem. I think that, that's quite important to realize. So we need to focus on the, on the bad practices of some and deal with them uh, with the data protection tools that we have or adapt our data protection tools. In some countries, introduce data protection legislation when it's not there. I think that's in trend, for instance, in quite a few countries in Africa. Um, so that, let, let's distinguish the two. It's not global trade that's an issue. It's how... Oh, it's uh, you know, it's, it's how it's be, the data that's underpinning it is utilized. So quite an important distinction to make. And I would actually say it's quite the contrary. I would say global trade is potentially a massive enabler for a lot of our rights. Um, We're now speaking about online trade. Uh, not, just, not just online. I'm, I'm talking about generally. I think if, if, we, look at, if we look at global trade... Um, you know, well, simply, you know, if you look at uh, economic development in itself, it's a, it's, it serves human empowerment. So, you know, if you've got if you've got an, a better economy, then you as an individual should benefit, as long as, of course, you've got not too much disparity between certain groups in society, etc. But you know, global trade should be a good thing. Cross-border trade should be a good thing because you can source better products, you can get cheaper, in theory it should be better for the consumer again, it helps your economic, your social development, etc. So you've got all these, um, these positive things that, that, that trade uh, brings. And I think what we should remember is that through open, free, cross-border trade, what comes with it is not just goods and services, it's information. And information in itself is potentially one of the strongest tools, if you will, or in human rights, or one of the strongest human rights in itself. I think we, should, we shouldn't lose sight. So the balance to be made, is, or the distinctions to be made, is, is between uh, you know, making sure that we do have those, uh, the, the, the possibility for information to flow and to benefit people, uh, as well as trade and the economy more widely, whilst having the protections in place, making sure that the protections are, are, are respected. Um, and maybe I just just would like to to mention a couple of um, of, uh, of of uh, sources. Um, we I can uh, commission a report by the Boston Consulting Group uh, last year called "Greasing the Wheels of the Internet Economy," which looked uh, if I'll just use one of the terms there. It looked at e friction, and basically looked at how economic and social development across the world in a number of countries, both ad advanced economies and, and, and less advanced economies, is negatively impacted the more obstacles you have to cross-border trade and, and obviously uh, information flows. Um, so there's, there's so, some good uh, country per country uh, data in particular that you might be um, interested to, to look at. And then when you go down one level, um, there's a, a more specific, there's a there was a whole discourse which is mentioned, I know, in, in Lucy's paper in Europe in particular in, in the wake of, of last year's uh, revelations about cloud computing. So it was, so some people talked about having emails that would be, for instance, restricted to just Germany. I think that's actually still being discussed, which is quite bizarre, frankly. Um, but they also talked about having a European cloud, or if not a national cloud. And I, I, I would actually encourage people to look at a memo that the European Commission issued on 15th of October, I remember precisely because I did a little background on it for, for my previous work. It was called, it's a memo on secure cloud computing. And they basically said, this is a silly idea because you lose all the benefits of cloud computing and online platforms if you 
if you, if you compartmentalize, if you keep it in national borders, you lose it because you lose efficiencies, you lose the ability to go international, um, but also you lose be benefits in terms of security and stability and resiliency. You know, if you've got your servers just in your country and you have a natural disaster, just as one example of many, what happens? It just means you've got one point of failure if you've got a cyber attack against that facility. And I could go on. So uh, you, you just need to balance these things and, 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 and distinguish very clearly what are real problems that need to be uh, addressed, such as some really bad privacy or security practices, which hopefully we have the legal framework for, and if we don't have it, we should develop it versus the fact that global trade, in particular cross-border information flows as part of global trade and, and, and beside global trade, are a massive enabler economically, socially, and for citizens generally. I'll stop here for now, sorry. All right, no, no. Um, uh, Lucy made the case that uh, data localization, also mandatory user registrations are things people are talking about at ICANN. Do you feel that that is uh, something that uh, a lot of pressure is coming? Um, I, I, I don't know that this particular case, uh, I mean, I, I saw it in, in Lucy's paper, mandatory user registration. I'm not too knowledgeable about it. Um, you know, I think that, the, the, you know, we should have, a, I, I think someone in, in, from the Swedish government mentioned yesterday, you should have the same rights and obligations offline and online. That's fine. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the more you know, monitoring you have of individual users, the less freedom you have in, uh, effectively. I think in, in North Korea, there's a few people that use the internet, but when they're mainly, I think, university researchers. And if I understand correctly, when they use the internet, they have to have a, a mentor standing behind them to watch what, what they're doing. This is not a million miles away from user registration uh, in, that, in that sense. It depends how it's done, of course. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that this particular point is an issue, but I think there's a whole raft of issues as well described in Lucy's paper. But and you, and see, a, really you see a trend in, in data localization there? No, I think that I see a lot of talk about data localization. I just hope it's not going to go that way. Mm -hmm. um, right. I can come back on, on it later. Finally, Beryl, to you, are those, is that a concern in, in Kenya as well, in the countries in, in Africa that you've been to, that, that more and more countries want some kind of sovereign rights? over uh, the internet, and is that, is, is, is that going to affect uh, tra data flows? Um, actually, I want to bring a different angle of the African issues to the table, uh, because a lot of the things that are be being discussed are much more relevant in the Western um, countries and the more developed countries, but when you come to um, the so-called global south or sub-Saharan Africa for that matter, we are dealing with a whole different uh, set of issues. Uh, so even before we talk about um, data flows, data being kept within certain countries, let's talk about is this even available in the first place um, to, to the different traders. Um, you probably know um, uh, Sub -Saharan, Sub Saharan Africa is one of those, the major recipient of uh, development aid. Uh, but some of the questions that we've been asking is, um, is development aid really helping? Uh, we'd rather have more trade than aid. You know, and so when you put barriers that um, prevent um, uh, the promotion of trade, then um, you perpetrate um, what would say uh, poverty, and of course um, uh, 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 other violations of, of human rights that come with that. And so, going back to your question, um, it goes back to this whole issue of uh, uh, protection um, or or security national security, um, governments are very much interested in knowing what sort of transactions are going on um, across their borders. And so, uh, of course, uh, th that is something that um, uh, most governments are putting in place so that they're able to follow different transactions. But that having been said, one of the challenges that we have is that most African countries do not have um, policy and legislation framework to deal with um, security or to deal with data protection. In Kenya, for example, we don't have a data protection law. So even if we wanted, most of our traders wanted to enjoy uh, cross-border or international or global trade, they can't enjoy that much. For example, with a trade with, with Europe is restricted because of lack of um, uh, data protection laws. And so as, as such, uh, you find that uh, many European um, governments and even um, companies would want to limit um, 
their trade relations with countries in Africa because of that. And then um, you also look at issues around cybersecurity framework. Again, um, most countries do not have a, a, a real good cybersecurity framework. So um, people then are afraid to trade um, online because of that. And um, I, I would also say um, on the other side, it has to do with infrastructure and skills. Um, if you have low bandwidth, now we have undersea cables and it's improving. Kenya is uh, one of those countries that are a little bit more privileged, um, but still, um, the bandwidth is still terribly low, and so you can't enjoy as much free flow of information as you, it would be like in countries um, in the West. And um, so for me, I would say that uh, the problems that we face there is, is totally different, um, and it's just a need uh, for even governments in Africa to begin to realize that this is how um, um, national development is affected if they don't put uh, um, uh, some measures in, in place, uh, say, for example, infrastructure development, and then access for, for people. So most of the trade volumes in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in my country, for example, is led by small-scale producers. You know, really, um, we have a phrase in Kenya called juakali. Joakali simply is a Swahili word. It simply means um, hot sun. These are people who work outside. They don't have uh, shelters. They don't have shops. So you'll find them making, you know, uh, pots and pans out in the sun. They get hit, um, hit by the hot sun. Um, and so that is where the Joakali uh, sector came from. And so you find that most of the economies are driven by this sector. These are people who are just beginning to hear about the internet. They're beginning to hear that, you no, know, actually, you can sell your products online. And so then um, there's that whole issue of uh, knowledge and skills. How do they get their products online? Um, who is responsible to bring this education uh, to them? Um, we have a few uh, companies, uh, tech companies. Uh, for example, there is MFAM um, that is a mobile company that has developed uh, an app that can be used by small-scale farmers to locate where markets are, to locate pr uh, prices, and you know, uh, to get to know uh, where to sell their goods. But then um, this is just small, you know, it's just a small on a small scale, and um, they need they need some support. Um, Companies like those need support to, to make sure that um, these apps are available to many people, uh, that they are, they, they are um, publicized, and then that the farmers all themselves or even the small-scale producers are able to use these apps. Yeah. All right. Uh, how do you pronounce the joke? Juakali, J-U-A. Okay, it sounds and like... And then K-A-L-I. -K sounds like the Swahili equivalent of... If uh, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. <laughs> if, if God gives you hot sun, right. um, I could just add to that that you know in the in the developing countries, uh, that's actually where we see most growth. Mm -hmm. uh, Sort of an immense spike, actually, in the use of, of the eBay marketplace for, for exporting and importing. Right. Uh, so w we looked at developing countries, and you can see, you know, internet access has been increasing by 300% in mm -hmm. some developing countries, and we can see uh, eBay trade increasing by 800%. And also, there was this recent report by uh, Dahlberg, the, the consultancy, uh, a consultancy firm, uh, looking at internet openness and what it, what it means for uh, for the economy, and first of all, I think they have a very good way of defining internet openness because it's, it's sort of a holistic definition. Uh, so internet openness is defined as uh, freedom, interoperability, transparency, and security and privacy. Mm -hmm. um, so taking sort of this this broad uh, approach, and. Uh, Quite an interesting exercise they did was taking the, using the Freedom House Index of o internet openness, and we compared it to uh, to eBay exporting actually, and we can see that you know with openness comes the use of um, Trade. these platforms for for trading and vice versa the other end. All right, I, I asked John Jack the question, but maybe I should ask you: Do you see business as a kind of victim of the push? for privacy of the push to restrict data flows? Um, 
I have not been thinking about victims in this debate. All right. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot say that I see, you know, victims or... The question or, uh, really is, is business in any way suffering today? Is uh, uh, yes. I didn't realize yeah. you'd asked me that yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> I think in, in the way that business is suffering, and uh, indirectly us as users, is because all this would have damaged confidence in using the internet and, and, and e-commerce. I think that's a major factor. And using the cloud, for instance, and, and big data. I mean, big data is massively interesting. There was a panel yesterday on big data with someone from the World Economic Forum who works in particular with Senegal. And they're, to, they're trying to use data in terms of helping reduce food shortages, for instance. But they don't have enough data, so they want to gather more data. So actually, getting more data is not, in again, per se a bad thing. It's what you want to do with it, how you use it, it's the purpose and, and the use. I think that's quite important too. All right, and Manus, in your uh, research, did you find this, uh, this talk about data localization a concern? Uh, that's a big yes on that one. Uh, I think data localization was the largest concern expressed by companies uh, that we talked to, saying basically, except for the big one like Ericsson, uh, they can handle those kind of concerns. They don't like it, but they can afford it. The rest of them said, well, if you have that kind of regulation, we're not going to be able to move, move to that market. We're not going to be able to, uh, to be there. So that was really. Mm. And also they expressed not only that they cannot move there, but if they could move there and actually were able to uh, start business, perhaps they don't have to build their data center, but they, can use a they need to use a local data center. What they felt was that their data was less protected. You know, uh, a lot of them made the point that using the big, big, big players, uh, usually American, have their service here in Europe, so they can uh, be, uh, move all the data to Europe and have it processed here. They felt that their consumer were most uh, pleased with that, felt more secure. Mm -hmm. So they. If they then have to have move the data and store it in, for example, Vietnam, to take a, an example, consumer were very concerned about that move. Now using, of course, uh, uh, and eventually it is about that link between business uh, and consumer trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if nothing else, uh, finally, Lucy, the the question of uh, perhaps uh, the 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 equinet. I think is, is a term that has been used in India, certainly the idea that everybody should have access in the same ways uh, to the internet, that it should be equal uh, for all. I know that you found in your study that it wasn't just about data flows. It was about that very political component uh, to every country wanting their people to have uh, flows. Uh, do you see that as a large part of the kind of restrictions to data flows, or is the political component a small part? Um, it depends on the on the country, and it depends what is being, you know, what is being said and what, what what measure is being put in place, and is that you know really to protect people's privacy or is it a political thing? So you can you find this a lot, you know, post Snowden that people are saying, oh well, you know, we want to protect our data from you know foreign intelligence services, but is it actually something else? Is it something more political that they would just like to have more control over the citizens' data? So that's something definitely to bear in mind, I think, as we as we look at that. These. It's it's become a convenient. Excuse yeah. it, in a sense. In fact, I, I think it was your study that that said uh, that when Egypt shut down its net for five days, there was a, a, a loss of 90 million. Yeah. Now there's now there started to be some very interesting studies on the economic impacts of restricting of data flows, that, which of yeah. course is going to have is going to make governments and businesses. Well, the moment you put a dollar value to it, absolutely, uh, the interest levels increase. I want to come around to some of the solutions, and we've spoken to uh, we've spoken about a lot of the possible solutions that governments are using, that the internet uh, uh, multi-stakeholders have suggested. Of course, uh, data localization is not necessarily a positive term, but it is certainly something that is being spoken about. Uh, the mandatory user registration, I've certainly heard about that quite a lot. Um, 
the the push for the interception or the non interception of undersea cables um, is is one and 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 you've made a case for that data protection legislation that there must be uh, would you say a universal sort of code of not automatically you just need to have the framework in place we just mm. heard it about africa yeah, exactly you need exactly. it otherwise you know we talk about safe harbor agreements for instance to go back on boring terms um, you know africa cannot trade as much with europe as it likes for instance, India has had a, some sort of recognition of its data protection practices by the EU, and it's enabled a whole host of outsourcing activities to take place in India with, with massive GDP impact, which Africa cannot benefit from, simply, because it doesn't have the framework in place. They haven't put the framework in place. So it doesn't have to be universal, but it needs to have something. You know. Okay, looking at some of those, I, I'd like to uh, just ask if there are questions or comments that anyone in the audience wants to add. Go ahead, you, and then... There's you, and there's you, okay. Hi, uh, I'm Balint from Hungary, and uh, I'd like to comment on data localization. I have some experience, so we are working for uh, some critical infrastructure firms, for example, in my country, and we now have a cybersecurity framework that also talks about uh, data localization. And I think this is a very good thing because um, we talked about cloud uh, as an example. Uh, and uh, cloud is a very good example because uh, uh, it is very, so it's not very well understood in people's minds. And uh, since we have now uh, these law, or this set of laws, some people maybe start to think about if they move, uh, for example, critical uh, national information or critical business information out of their hands, uh, to a uh, foreign entity, uh, possibly without encryption. But even with encryption, uh, we've seen many cases uh, in which uh, the, the data was encrypted, but uh, the, the service was not available. That was not on purpose, but this could be on purpose. And uh, availability is a very important aspect of security, I think. So uh, data localization is, I think, an idea that should be introduced, but it should not be enforced. All right. Um, the gentleman here. Oh. Or do you want, do you want to oh, go no. first? I, I guess we'll I can go to. first. Uh, my name is David Chanda. I'm from uh, Zambia. And I represent uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, in one of the districts in Zambia. And I must say, um, uh, this discussion here, I, is very, very inspiring, especially for me coming from uh, the private sector. I um, noticed that there's, there's been very little talk of uh, the role of the private sector, um, especially in, uh, uh, you know, in, in this hot topic that, that uh, has been uh, under discussion in this forum. Um, I must mention that I was inspired yesterday uh, during, during the, the official opening when uh, the minister uh, mentioned uh, the relationship between internet freedom and uh, economic uh, growth. I think that this is uh, one thing that we need to propagate and uh, encourage. Um, coming from Africa, we face with so many uh, challenges, economically speaking. And I personally believe that as long as people are not economically empowered, they are not going to realize most of these issues that we're talking about. Freedom of the internet is not going to mean anything to somebody who is you know, struggling to put food on the table. And I think that now the challenge that we're faced with is to be able to look at the internet and see how we can use it to empower people, especially in uh, uh, rural areas, speaking of Africa. Um, I'm encouraged by uh, uh, what eBay has said, but I guess what we need to do, especially in Africa, is be able to explore uh, opportunities and see how we can use eBay you know, to be able to sell uh, our products and, and services. Because once we do that, then our people are going to be economically empowered. And once they are empowered, believe you me, there's going to be a stronger voice coming out of Africa and coming, coming out of uh, you know, the, the so-called third world country on issues of uh, privacy and things mm -hmm. like that. As long as we don't have that, as long as our people are still struggling to eat, you know, struggling to put a piece of cloth on their back. Believe you me, uh, this discussion is uh, not going to mean much. Thank you. 
Right. And, and you have a great, it's interesting, you know, Jean Jacques, the whole idea that the internet was above everything, it was seamless, that people would be able to use it. And then you, you find that the problems are online and offline uh, keep countries in exactly the same brackets as well. I mean, I think the, the, we all know that the internet is, a, is just a tool, mm -hmm. it's and a it wonderful has, yeah. tool, but um, yeah. Uh, sorry, the gentleman in the front and then at the back. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, all the panelists, also for a very interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Torbjörn Fredriksson. I uh, represent Ankted uh, from Geneva. And we did uh, a study on cloud, uh, the cloud economy, as we called it, in the developing countries last year. And uh, I think uh, I would echo what uh, our uh, speaker from Kenya mentioned here, that sometimes uh, I get the feeling that we are, we're talking about a situation that exists in perhaps the US uh, and, and uh, Europe and, and some other rich countries that does not really apply yet in many developing countries. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind when, for instance, when we talk about data localization, there is, uh, as someone mentioned here, if there's a question of whether governments would require data localization. There's another question whether it would be desirable to have more possibilities for data localization. And, and if you look uh, throughout Africa, there's definitely a huge uh, problem of a lack of local data centers in this country where you have to rely on service being located in Europe or, or, or even further away, which increases latency, often increases the cost of using cloud, cloud services here. Uh, if you add to that the lack of data protection and privacy uh, policies and legislation in these countries, this starting point from uh, moving towards the cloud is very, very different in these countries. And I think one needs to keep that in mind. And we look at uh, Safaricom in Kenya, for instance. They decided that they had to have a, a, a local data center in, in Kenya uh, because it was not reliable to have their data uh, stored somewhere else. And it was not mainly for protecting the interests of the consumers, but simply for, 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 uh, for financial reasons. It was too costly, to, and there were too many breakdowns and interruption in the internet access and so on and so forth. So I think we should keep this in mind when we talk about this, because there's, it's clear right now the cloud economy is, is very much driven by a, a large number of very large American companies, primarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, they have a strong interest in making this as global as possible because the larger the economies of scale, the cloud. big cost savings, but it's also big business for them. Yeah, sure. uh, and I think uh, there is uh, right now a tendency to almost push the, the situation that applies in the north into this developing countries, and it's not really ready for that yet. And I think one needs to keep that in mind. All right. Can I just react very quickly on that one? Because there's a lot of sure. new solutions that are coming to cloud okay. with new types of data centers that are being developed specifically with, in particular, Africa in mind, with cheaper solutions and also <laughs> environmentally friendly. Um, so I think in the next two, three years, we should see a lot more of those. They're smaller data centers, but they can really help. So if you don't have the bandwidth, you can still access them locally. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, often too optimistic, but I, uh, I hope it will, you'll see more of that happen. Beryl so. had something to um, add. Uh, just to add on to what you're saying, um, in terms of solutions also, um, if, uh, I'm glad what, about what you've said about eBay, but you find that many Africans still cannot really ac access eBay as much. And so there are other platforms that have come that are much more accessible to them. For example, OLX, where uh, you, you, anyone can go on uh, OLX and transact on OLX, but then also the ease with which you can transact on, on OLX. Um, most Africans do not have credit cards. So to be able mm. to do uh, business um, online, you need credit cards. Um, even to apply uh, for a credit card, it's very difficult because of the, the rules that are put there, uh, how to, um, uh, what you need to, to qualify for one. And um, so you find localized solutions, for example, the M-Pesa by Safaricom, oh. which now allows people to use um, M-Pesa to transact online. And, and OLX is M-Pesa based, and although you can still use other, uh, other uh, for forms of payment. So uh, it's just basically trying to find solutions that work in, uh, in countries or in jurisdictions where um, maybe the, the global trends may not necessarily work as we work towards joining the, the rest of the world. Right. And, and I think Torbjorn had a very good point on the sort of the, the cost aspect. Yeah. Um, because whether it's forced or whether it's, uh, it's not forced, um, Sort of the question, does it add costs to the small businesses? And those are small businesses competing globally. So adding costs to them in, in Brazil 
affects their ability to compete with the Indonesian small businesses. Sure. So that perspective. And I think mm. your, your paper had spoken about the fact that every country has to realize that their SMEs are now able to uh, the, compete with SMEs around the world. That's where we think yes, that stops where them. Going. Yes, that's where we're going. Yes, that's where we're going. So just as you know, online and offline is blurring, uh, country borders are uh, in some aspects. And, and I would say also, you know, whether these are small businesses, whether those are individuals, whether those are entrepreneurs, uh, it's also a sort of a blurring um, categorization. Of, of all yeah. of them. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion so far about how governments try to uh, restrict data, data localizations. But I was wondering if you could talk about situations where companies find it uh, interesting for themselves to, to restrict data. I'm thinking about intellectual property owners and so on. They might restrict the products that they sell, the movies they want to show to uh, specific regions, mostly often Western regions, and then uh, developing countries aren't served, th those markets aren't served. Now, this seems to me like old thinking uh, being applied to the internet. The internet uh, removes the tyranny of distance only to see it reintroduced as an artificial scarcity. Um, wondering if you have any opinions about this. This is relevant to the panel. Uh, it's also very, very trivial to circumvent this kind of artificial scarcity if you know how and if you're willing to skirt the law. Thanks. Which you can do around the lady there. If you could just pass the mic down to the lady. Thank you. I'm Mariana Jabiris from uh, Canada. I work with HIFEX, a global network of free expressions organizations. Um, my question is a slightly different angle on human rights and business, and it's about the export of surveillance equipment and blocking equipment and so on, which of course has huge concerns, um, but I understand is financially motivated. You know, it's a huge, huge trade in that. So I'm wondering if anyone of the panelists had any thoughts about restrictions on that kind of trade and the political solutions around that. I know that's a big debate right now in the free expression community. Thank you. And finally, the gentleman here. Uh, my name is Luis Neves, and uh, I'm coming from the business side. Uh, thank you so much. I've been learning a lot. Um, but uh, I, I felt touched because I'm coming from a German company. And, um, and since, since I'm using D-Mail in Germany, Mail in Germany, I would like to understand from you what is the real disadvantage for me to using D-Mail. And since the company that is using D-Mail is my company, I would like you to explain me, that to me. So I go to my CEO and tell him, look, you're a stupid guy. We have to <laughs> shut down that thing. So that's <laughs> one question. The second question is, is not a question, it's a comment. We are discussing very complex things here uh, with different levels. So when it comes to Africa or to the de developing world, so the basic thing is that telecommunications or internet should be something that everybody should have access to. In the past, when uh, telecommunications companies were public companies, we spoke a lot about universal service, which was about giving access to uh, telecommunications to everybody, because that was seen as a tool for development. So we moved now to the private sector, and this became a commercial thing. So now you provide service, but you have to pay for it. Well, you had to pay before, but there was, let's say, a responsibility from the governments to provide access to everybody. But we moved away from that. We are now in a different world, and that's the world where we live. But I think the concept of uh, providing service to everybody should be kept from a policy maker mind mindset or, and so on. Then one comment about this discussion. I have not yet heard the word responsibility. Good point. Because this is all about ethic and responsibility. How business and people behaves. And that's the bottom line. You, know, you can do all types of studies. You know, everybody will make a study which fits his own suit. Because we are all selling something to each other. But the question in the bottom line is how ourselves in the business community and as citizens, we behave in a responsible manner so that we ensure that we do business and relate with each other in a proper manner and whereby we respect each other. And I think that's the bottom line that we need to understand 
at all levels of this discussion and in, in all the complexity of this discussion. All right, thank you. Um, uh, we have, before we go back to our speakers, one last time, if anyone has any comments, because so far what we've really got is a lot of comments on, uh, go ahead. Sir, you wanted to say something? Oh, do you have the mic? Go ahead. That's me, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I just, uh, again, uh, I think uh, I have a, a short comment on the data localization. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, for, for many businesses it could be a barrier. Uh, uh, I mean, governments, uh, uh, you know, intervening in internationally or domestically uh, 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 traffics um, as for many, many, for various reasons, but it's not all bad. I mean, uh, a very small portion of this is actually good. Uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, we, we read that uh, a very uh, important uh, Swedish think tank uh, are having their servers in Ukraine of all places. And, uh, you know, we know, for instance, vast majority of Swedish political parties, their mail servers are based in U.S. I'm sure a lot of intelligence agencies are thrilled about that. So, you know, there are, there are and actually hosting your servers in Sweden is more expensive than having your servers in Germany and the U.S. So it yeah, has a... Yeah, exactly, and you know, people look at the numbers. I mean, the accounting department, they say, hey, we can rent $5 a cent in Texas. Why we should have it in Umeå or in Stockholm? So, uh, and, and actually the, 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 uh, the cost is a very big uh, issue and people usually don't consider this in, uh, in special cases. We, we, we had a case in uh, uh, Iran, for instance, we had the, the email of a minister, like minister of trade at yahoo.com. I mean, it's, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, I, I, it speaks for itself, I think. So it's not mm -hmm. all bad. Fair and uh, if you could pass uh, one and then I'll come to you. Thank you. My name is Ali Akbar Musavi. I live in the United States, but I'm from Iran. Uh, my question is from eBay. Um, uh, I think you know that a couple of months ago, in February 2013, U.S. government has uh, issued a certain, certain license uh, which exempts uh, ICT stuff, all software, hardware, and services for uh, to sell uh, Iranians and having transaction, money transaction between U.S. and uh, all, all companies and Iranians. My question is that uh, are you aware of this uh, license? Uh, why eBay didn't actually implement uh, so far the this license. People cannot buy anything via eBay. This is stuff that I mentioned. What's your plan, actually? <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, I'm happy to put you in contact with someone within eBay, uh, and we can follow up and get a response to you. <coughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to follow up But in, up ge in, in general, uh, Hannah, when it comes, as we s was trying to say earlier, uh, two political pressures of this kind that are legislative, What's e does eBay have like a policy or is it? A yes, of course we have, and it's very clear in our uh, privacy and data protection policies. Uh, we work very closely with, with law enforcement. Uh, when they have lawful requests for, for data from us, we of course uh, cooperate with them. We also see sort of overreaching requests and those we do not respond to. Um, but as with the, the cyber attack we had uh, now recently, we almost immediately start working with both law enforcement, whether it's in the FBI, because we have our services in the US, mm -hmm. and uh, external experts. Right. And those are not easy, uh, easy issues. But, and we also work with law enforcement with regard to you know, what can and cannot be sold, of course. Um, okay, we have very elaborated uh, procedures uh, for and working And in different with countries that would be different? In diff yes, it would be in different countries. Uh, because different countries have different restrictions. Uh, and it can be anything from, you know, um, well, go from weapons to certain toothpastes. All right. uh, and what we can do is we can use our technology, so we can have filters. Uh, we can work directly with whether it's law enforcement or the uh, authority. And then we rely on our community. Uh, our community is very important. Uh, they consist of rights owners, for example, telling us that this is uh, a counterfeit purse. Please take it off. Okay. Uh, and we rely on users to tell us that this is not a good buyer. Uh, cut him off right. or her. Um, fair enough. Uh, Lucy, if, if you could just add to that a bit, because of course we're not just trying to target eBay here, yeah. but the general idea that's, that companies perhaps use different 
um, uh, business compliance practices, if you like, in different countries when it comes to the security of one citizenship versus the other. The, the reason I'm coming to that is after the Snowden revelations last year, it seemed, at least to us in India, I'm sure to many in the subcontinent, uh, that the same companies who had denied access uh, to Indian agencies, not that we we want Indian agencies to get that access necessarily, um, but but that had denied access in one country were were happily providing that kind of access uh, in another. Uh, I'm speaking about Facebook. I'm speaking about Google. I'm speaking about, in fact, every company that was was named. Is there that concern as well that there's a kind of duality uh, in 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 the privacy? Sphere. I think companies come up against this all the time, and this is something, you know, looking at um, international human rights standards, there is sometimes a conflict with national laws, and businesses come up against this all the time in how data is requested, blocking requests, you know, it's it's definitely um, something that companies struggle struggle with. Can I just um, address the surveillance question sure, very, sure. very quickly? Yes. Um, so, I'm from the UK, so the, you know, the trade there in, you know, we you can call it surveillance, cyber security, whatever, you know, it's a very big industry. And, um, you know, you've got the, the controls on it are either sanctions or export control. But in the middle, there is, you know, all of this uh, technology which is not subject to export control but could still pose a risk to human rights. The government, the UK government has recognised this and the businesses are starting to recognise this as well. And they're actually coming, you know, to all the amazing work that organisations like Privacy International and Citizen Lab have done, you know, starting to realise that these organisations are pushing for export control, further export control, they will get it. But even if it happened tomorrow, that will take two or three years to filter down international legislation. So where an organisation like mine comes in is saying, well, what do, you, what do businesses need to do in the meantime? So we're actually starting to provide human rights guidance for these kind of companies in the UK at the moment as to how to identify and assess the risks and how they should mitigate them. But I can talk to you about that afterwards if you're interested. All right, and before I wrap up, um, oh, was there one last question? Any other questions? Oh, there are, oh, oh, I haven't Thank come you. to you yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was seeing some of those going up, and I was. Uh, go ahead. Alejandro Pisanti, very good comment uh, in two parts. Uh, first part, I think that the, so the, the, the word uh, the word risk management or risk management framework should be permeate these discussions, and I heard it only from eBay and from Lucy. But uh, it really would add a lot of clarity to things that have been said, like the Iranian ministers having Yahoo accounts. You have to assess the risks, the benefits of intervening against the risks, and, uh, and the cost. And you have also to, to look at the marginal increase in risks that certain conducts include. Because, uh, I mean, uh, to, to put it uh, in a very simple everyday example, people in Mexico, when the states, when the US decided to start fingerprinting people who were going into the US, Lots of friends of ours would say, I, 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 I will boycott the US because uh, they, they, they will now have information about my travel. Uh, sincerely, when, you, when, when you're fingerprinted entering a country, the only thing that's known is that it's you who is entering the country. But your credit card has a lot more information of where you're going, how you're spending, who you're spending it with. It's a correlation of the information that actually means something. So going back, uh, that Yahoo account for your Iranian minister may be meaningless addition of risk uh, if you consider that already the traffic is being inspected and you have a channel that's actually a secure channel for the important communications, which is completely different from that. Also, the analysis has to be made differently for official, for government uh, communications and for private communications. Of course, government has to be lo data located, but private companies, private data, again, what is the increase in the specific risks that you're incurring by not localizing or, by, or what you gain by localizing? And finally, on export controls, uh, you speak about weapon export controls uh, for cyber uh, tools or cyber weapons to a hacker community, and this can be a white hat or black hat or gray hat or a harlequin colored hat. They, their eyes roll because they know that you know the malicious uses by authoritarian countries will get the software anyway, or they're developing it in-house, in or they're getting counterfeit uh, pirate copies, whatever. So again. It's think realistically the of what are the risks and how are they are actually increased or mitigated. All right, thank you. And Gökhan. Uh, given the time strain, it's safe to say that the panelists covered most of the questions, so we're happy okay. to we're happy be able to, to say that. that. But also, um, we received um, certain tweets from mostly from Africa, uh, touching upon the the, uh, the importance of what is being talked here uh, regarding Africa, also India. 
especially about data localization and then laws and regulations regarding uh, the Indian case. Uh, we received email, Twitter tweets from Kenya, Ethiopia, and Sudan uh, asking several questions uh, with regards to Lucy's point about the data localization and its contribution to the fragmentation of the internet. Uh, and also, Hannah said eBay accounts are safe. There are several challenges and responses to that, um, given the, the uh, contrary evidence uh, available also online, people tell. And of course, coming from Turkey, I would have loved to say a few things about Turkey because, as you might know, as you might know, <laughs> Twitter and YouTube uh, have been, well, Twitter not now, but YouTube is still um, um, banned in Turkey. And of course, when people want to, or uh, you know, they, they, they desire to reach such platforms, when things are banned, they use VPN and DNS uh, changes. And, and of course, online banking system alerted, well, uh, in a nutshell, uh, re-educated the Turkish nation about online banking and security, given that when people change their DNS and also use several VPN services, uh, their security and privacy is, was also under attack. Um, and that was my contribution. You mean Thank just you very the much. act of... Exactly. Well, Thank you very much. That certainly makes Thank it you. interesting. We are going to have to wrap up uh, this, uh, this very interesting uh, conversation. And as I started out, um, as someone who's not an, uh, not, not an expert or an insider, I, I was particularly interested by everything everyone had to say. I'd just like to go around to all of you. Um, and, and if you could give us one idea that you think should drive uh, this, this kind of uh, no trade-off idea between security and privacy when it comes to businesses in the next year, what would that be? Um, I'll go back to the data protection uh, data localization discussion. Uh, I think there's one issue you could discuss, we should discuss. I mean, looking for a business perspective, these are, you know, red lights, we don't want to go here. There's being forced to localize. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for commercial localization. Picking up from your point there, why is it better to go rooted in Germany? I don't have the answer, but if you want that, the services there, do it, but don't have governments forcing you to do it. Mm -hmm. it. That the only reason civil. should be the economic flow. It should be an important factor when discussing these issues. Right. And, uh, you know, all this. So there's, there's a balance between here, between enforcing localization and data storage. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are actually solutions out there you can already use without being forced to use them. So that's an important discussion to, to take continue forward. forward. Thank you. Hannah, go ahead. Yes. So McKinsey Global Institute, they recently released a report where they could correlate connectedness, so increased connectedness with uh, GDP growth. And to me, that tells me that that's the way we need to go. So more connectedness, and that needs to translate into to policy as well. So connected policies, and I think we would like to see more international cooperation. The EU, for example, EU and Japan, they uh, last week, I think, announced a, a dialogue, a cyber dialogue. That's so a beginning. That's, that's big. Yeah. All right. Betty? Um, I think one of the things that we should take home with us is uh, just removal of clawback um, uh, clauses or in policies and directives that governments give. On the one hand, um, they want to promote um, e-commerce and uh, global trade, but then on the other hand, you come, you see um, clawback uh, policies um, uh, for example, data localization or even surveillance and things like that. Um, uh, for example, in my country, there's a promotion of uh, business pro processing zones, and which uh, um, allows for a lot of business outsourcing um, services. But if you have data localization, then that um, uh, prevents uh, that the growth of that sector. Um, I'd like to follow up on Magnus's point about, you know, this, and the point from the gentleman from Hungary about this forced data localization. You know, forcing people to do things is not going to bring back trust in, um, you know, forced data localization, forced SIM registration. It's this which is disruptive. Um, so, but what can we turn this into an opportunity? You know, what if, what if 
people could choose where they store their data. And now we've touched on this a little bit, but Microsoft is about to start offering this to enterprise customers that they can choose where they store their data. So they already do. They already do. They've yeah. done it now. So you know, if this kind of filters down to users, this I can see. You know, this has the potential to engage users in in their rights also, and you know, learn about privacy policies in different countries. And we can start kind of this moving that this becomes a competitive advantage for businesses. I think there's a, a company in Finland which is already doing this on their marketing literature. Is saying, you know, <laughs> I think it's AppSecure. I think they're called. And is there is there an index already a report out on which is the country best? Uh, placed for you to store your data? Uh, no, I d I'm not sure if there is. I'm not sure if there's a, a compilation well, if, that there should be. Well, if the conversation on data localization does take that strong... Absolutely, stronger, and if you start I'm being I'm engaged... I'm sure that's, that's something for that. the future. Go ahead, Shant. Um I mean, f for me, the sort of two words would be openness and choice. Um, let's to go back to that. It's about, you know, I'm not saying you should not localize. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. want to, you should have the choice to do so. If you have weighed the risks and you believe that some of your data should absolutely remain not even in your country, but in, in your building, you should absolutely be able to do so. That's a question of, 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 of choice and assessment of, of the importance of the data. Um, but you, sh you should do that in, a, in an informed manner. Just one quick example, if I may, which is health records. Health records, my personal health records, well, I might be tempted to say I should keep them here in my country. That might seem right, but at the same time, there's a really interesting uh, project between Finland and Estonia. They've, been, they've established a data protection uh, framework for this. But basically, what, there's a lot of exchanges between Estonians and Finns. You, they, they, they go to each other's countries very often. And they have now a joint database for health records with all, all sorts of data protections in place so that if you're a Finn a visiting talent and you have to go to the local doctor in emergency, the local doctor will have access to your health records so they'll be able to, um, to, 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 to uh, help you better, basically, to, to look after you better. So you just need to, to think cleverly about, you know, why is this that I want my data to be local? How important is it and which type of data? And then you can have a hybrid model or you can just have it locally or you can have it all internationally depending on the level of risk. So, so openness and choice. choice. Keep it open. Don't, don't force it closed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much. It's been a privilege uh, to have moderated the panel and then to have heard from Gyokan about the world uh, that is also taking part in this discussion. Uh, if we could give a, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. <laughs> and another one for our digital curators who've been... Uh, through this entire, um, in fact, two days, really, been keeping the conversations going. So thanks a lot to all of you. And it's time for lunch. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you.